I feel like reading Jung or Jung-derived works is something akin to understanding the cosmic horror in the H.P. Lovecraft universe. So in Lovecraft's writings, the characters, if they understand, like really understand the cosmic horror, it breaks their brain, at least a little. And that sets them apart from everybody else who hasn't wrestled with the concept of an indifferent and hostile universe. In reading the different sources for the Jung video last week, I felt like there is a similar underlying writing style. Bunch of different authors, but they all had this similar writing style that was really unique. And it's almost like understanding Jung and his research changes the way you speak and maybe even the way you think. This is almost like the Sapir Whorf linguistic relativity hypothesis, if you took intro or language or things like that, where the words that you know changes the way that you think. And I've seen that same weird writing style in the works of Jordan B. Peterson. That's right, folks. We're doing this. 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. We're doing this. As me, a woman, a cognitive psychologist, a scientist, an atheist, a feminist, let's just kitchen sink this fucker, a person with bipolar disorder, anxiety, and OCD, a content creator working on being a dink fam, a gamer who tends to roll chaotic good, all of these things. Let's just say that Jordan B. Peterson is somebody I want to keep tabs on. He came to my attention, and many others as well, probably, first when he started speaking out against the C-16 bill in Canada. This bill wanted to add trans people as a protected group against hate crimes, hate speech, things like that. And he gained his talking head status by voicing concerns over going to jail for misgendering someone, which isn't even a consequence of the bill, but feelings don't care about your facts. Then he solidified his talking head status by being a person who would criticize PC culture run amok and also being somebody who was rallying against the rise of postmodern neo-Marxism in the West and in academics. Natalie Wynn, ContraPoints, has a video talking about Peterson and Pomo Nomo, so link somewhere, description, card, something. So check that out if you haven't already. And yeah, I don't care much for Dr. P as a result of friction between my adjectives and his apparent or inferred beliefs. I say inferred because if you've ever seen him talk, you know that he can be very hard to pin down on exactly what he means. Why say something succinctly in a free exchange of ideas when you can throw an expensive word salad at your opponent, thus making them have to try to figure out exactly what you said, spend time defining what they think your intended meaning was, instead of being able to launch an effective counter-argument right from the get-go. Ah, sneaky sneaky, Dr. P. Well, that and the Jungian-style madness I discussed at the beginning of this video, that might have something to do with it too. As a cognitive psychologist and a scientist, I do have concerns with Peterson's work. You're going to get a steaming hot cup of tea from me on this one, but a couple things first. One, disclaimer. These are my thoughts, my feelings, my experiences. These are not universal truths. Two, caveat. Given some of the things I've talked about on this channel, like bipolar disorder, bidysmorphia, narcissistic personality disorder, I do value research that comes out of counseling and clinical. The people who do good research, mwah, keep doing more. You're great. You're awesome. I love it. Third, when this channel was just a twinkle in my eye and 
thinking about videos I would talk about, I was kind of nervous talking about counseling because I had a couple friends who never finished but were working towards counseling PhDs. They have since revealed themselves to be exploitative and manipulative cheaters, so I don't really care about hurting their feelings anymore. So yay me. Okay, the hot take. In my experience, on average, counseling psychologists don't tend to be the best at the whole scientific research endeavor. In my applying to grad school video, I talk about the difference in schooling between the squishy counseling psychologists and the not squishy experimental psychologists. And I talk about for a thesis based degree, it's different or it can be different between the two. For an experimental degree, you need to do your own research. For a counseling degree, you may be given a data set by your advisor and told to analyze it in a way it wasn't designed for. Now, if you looked at the Reddit survey write-up thing I did, I did one of these analyses, kind of. I gathered the data, and then I did a spaghetti analysis to just see what stuck. As I describe in the write-up, I'm doing it in the accepted way, where we're not publishing the findings, we're just doing this as an exploratory thing to guide future research, to inform future hypotheses, experiments, whatever, instead of a final conclusion. And in counseling programs that I've seen, they do these sort of exploratory analyses, write up what sticks, and that's their thesis. And that's not good science. Granted, this is just my experience from seeing two programs in person and hearing about other programs that other people went to. Maybe not every program in the country is run this way, but the ones that I know of were. Also, the case could be made that to be a good counselor, you might not need to be a good scientist. However, I would like to think that counselors out in the wild do have some good solid critical thinking skills behind them so that they can make good educated decisions about what treatment protocols they want to implement and which ones they don't. I was brought up academically that Freud and Jung were bad approaches to psychology and were bad science. They're unfalsifiable, they're untestable. If you watch the videos, you know what I'm talking about there. In scripting out this video, originally I was just going to talk about Freud and Jung here, but quickly realized that it, was, it wasn't going to be quick, and so they got their own videos. So I'm thorough. There's timestamps. The bottom line for both Freudian and Jungian theories are that the underlying science is bad. It's untestable, unfalsifiable, bad. Why am I spending so much time on Freud and Jung other than a historical curiosity? Because Peterson's approach is Jungian. He's a Jungian psychologist. And I actually read the overture first and then started scripting out the episode. And so reading it, it was just a lot. And then reading it again with a better understanding of Jungian psychology, and it started making sense, at least in context. Other channels have gone through and tried to make sense of Peterson on the whole, and other channels have even gone through the 12 Rules of Life book and tried to make sense of it. So what am I going to do different? Well, not the same flavor of a psychologist as Peterson. He's counseling. I'm cognitive. We are in the same discipline. So I would like to go through his work, look at what he's citing, look at what arguments he's making, and see if they have any scientific merit behind them, or if it's just sort of like Jung and more in the realm of pseudoscience. I'm planning on reviewing the literature he's citing, but this first chapter has no references. Nada. Uh, so this video is basically going to be, here's what he said, here's my reaction to what he said, or here's what I think he's trying to say, because the style madness is in full effect here. Player 2 has joined. 
you like lobster. I am skipping the foreword in this review because I don't like it. It doesn't really inform the rest of the book. It's basically just the guy writing its history with Peterson, and it kind of feels like a sales pitch for a book I already bought. So skip. The first chapter of the 12 rules of life isn't actually a rule. It's the overture. In the overture, Peterson basically talks about where the book came from and then kind of the central theme of the book. This is admittedly the first self-help book I've read, so I don't know if this life history of the book is normal or if it's just a Peterson thing, but regardless, life history of the book. Dr. P begins by talking about his experiences on Quora, and in specific, the question, what are valuable things everybody should know. He also talks a little bit about his previous book, The Maps of Meaning, which you can tell is an academic book because it is very hard to get your hands on it without sinking several hundred dollars in the process. Yes, I looked on Amazon and other places. Like I said, I'm thorough. Academic books tend to have small runs, so it's surprising if more than like a couple hundred copies get printed. These go out to different universities, libraries, friends of the author, and so they don't really make it into wider circulation where you'd be able to go to Barnes and Noble and pick up a copy. Peterson also spends a little time talking about his reception on things like YouTube or Patreon. He says that he's always surprised when people respond positively to what I'm saying. Given its seriousness and strange nature, I can't do Peterson. I'm sorry. I'll try. So I do want to focus on what's being written in the book by Peterson and not Peterson out in the wild. But there is something that's been kind of niggling at me with this emphasis on how surprised he is. So I see this in two and a half ways. One interpretation is that he's legitimately surprised that people are responding positively to his work. Maybe he's surprised because it is an academic subject and kind of dry, and hey, cool, people are liking my stuff. The half one related to this is maybe he's surprised at the positive reception because of his emphasis on the post-Marxist, no, postmodern neo-Marxist takeover of academia and how much of an outcast he is. And so he doesn't get a warm reception in academia, but outside of it he does, and that's surprising. The other interpretation is that this is an attempt to say that he's popular, that people like what he's saying. Come, these people like me. You should like what I'm saying and buy my books and go to my speaking tours, and I am an authority on this. Trust me. Sort of arguing from a numbers standpoint for why he's an authority. And the interpretation of this depends on how cynical you think Peterson is, I guess. I'm not sure. I don't really know what to make of this, but three and a half pages of the 11-page overture are centered on this narrative. So, as I said, one of my goals for this series is to go through his references Is the interpretation correct? Makes sense? What are they? Are they well-received, peer-reviewed, whatever? And they are missing from this chapter, and that kind of bothers me. There's notes in the book from me all over the place, citation needed, citation needed, because he says things but then doesn't back them up. And it needs be remarked that I am not the target audience for this book. And... I'm used to the scientific writing style where you have just references for everything, including picking your nose. It needs to have some empirical support. And pop science, the ones I've read, have still been referenced, but like I said, I haven't read a self-help book, so I don't know if this is normal or not, but give me the references, Dr. P. I need them. Just as an aside, he refers to maps of meaning a bunch 
in this overture, and I'm not sure if he's going to continue to do this in the rest of the book. So if any fans of Peterson happen to be watching this channel, I would be interested in knowing what are your feelings on him talking about this book that is next to impossible to get your hands on, especially if you're not academically affiliated. So apparently in Maps of Meaning, he argued that historical stories and myths and legends weren't trying to describe the world, but were instead designed to try and convey moral information. Counterexamples of this pop into mind pretty readily for me because I'm a bit of a myth geek. One example off the top of my head is an explanation for the Devil's Tower rock formation, I think in Wyoming. So according to Kiowa and Lakota legends, the Devil's Tower rock formation was formed when a bunch of girls went out and realized they were being hunted by some bears. And so they ran and they ran and they ran and they got on top of a climbable rock formation and realized that the bears would be able to follow them up there. So they pray desperately to the Great Spirit to help them out, and the Great Spirit does. So the rock that they're on rises up, and the bears can't get to them, but that doesn't stop them from trying. So the weird markings on the side of the rock formation are from the bears trying to get up at the girls. And it rose so high that when it reached its apex, the girls were turned into stars, and we know them today as the Pleiades constellation. So it's not really a moral tale. It's not like the moral of the story is pray to the great spirit when bears are after you and maybe something good will happen. I mean, there's not a moral in that sense. It's an explanation. I mean, you can almost make a case that this fits in the order and chaos distinction that he has going where the girls represent order and the bears represent chaos, but... I'm not necessarily sold on that. Part of this recurring morality play is the dance between order and chaos. And I really wish he would have said more about this because from the little bit he said in the overture, I really don't understand how this dance relates to how people should live their lives. So we have the first big concept for the book, order and chaos. This is also where we start to see the Jungian influences pretty strongly. Peterson describes order with a capital O as where the people around you act according to well-understood social norms and remain predictable and cooperative. It's the world of social structure, explore territory, and familiarity. The state of order is typically portrayed symbolically, imaginatively, as masculine. It's the wise king and the tyrant, forever bound together as society is simultaneously structure and oppression. As so not Peterson. I'm going to say it here. When Dr. P starts talking about symbols and representations and stuff, we are back into Jung country with the brain-breaking references trying to sort out what those meanings are. The wise king is like James Bond. He's cool, calm, and collected. The king provides order through rules and principles for themselves and for those around them, leading from the front. The tyrant is the dark form of the wise king, has a very narcissistic view of himself. Instead of the regal bearing coming from having integrated the manly archetypes, the tyrant has obtained a fragile masculinity and is fiercely trying to defend it. If I go through every archetype as it comes up, we're going to be here all day. So I'm just going to hit the big ones and let the lesser ones slide. As per Jung, order can be found in the persona archetype. The persona archetype is the socially acceptable version of you that you present to the world. So it's not your true self, it's you with social norms in place. Chaos, with a capital C, is when something unexpected happens. From his example, these are negative things like losing your job or being cheated on. As the antithesis of symbolically masculine order, it's presented imaginatively as feminine, its creation and destruction, the source of new things and the destination of the dead, as nature, as opposed to culture, is simultaneously birth and demise. Back to Jung, chaos is held in the shadow archetype. The shadow archetype is kind of like the Freudian id, 
It holds the socially unacceptable thoughts, drives, memories, feelings, things like that. They can be positive or negative. I'm not sure why Peterson has included the gendered nature of order and chaos in this. I could see if this was more of an academic thing, and you would want to include that for completeness and accuracy, but that's not what he's doing here. This is pop science. So, depending on how cynical you think Peterson is, this could be to appease the target audience. I think there's a pretty good general consensus here that the target audience for this book is young men who are kind of disillusioned with the world, feel lost don't feel like they have a place in it, and are looking to restore some sense of order. And so if you can tell these men, especially those with more incel-y, nice guy tendencies, that they're on the side of order, order is masculine, the feminine nature is chaotic and in opposition to the order. I could see that checking a few boxes for these guys and getting them interested and invested. Peterson seems to be shifting order and chaos from personal features of personality into external things that happen to you, which feels like a deviation from Jung, but I don't know it well enough to say for sure. Peterson talks about the Taoist emphasis on the balance between light and dark, order and chaos, and certainly it's not the only place it pops up in human history. The Greeks, for example, the classical Greeks, maybe the current Greeks, have the story of Daedalus and Icarus, where Daedalus, the wing maker and labyrinth maker, made wings and is flying the appropriate safe flying distance. Icarus, on the other hand, is having a great time, flies too close to the sun, his wings melt off, and he dies. The moral of this story is that the middle path is the appropriate path to take. Leave some room for some fun and indulgence, but also be reserved and serious. You need to have the balance between the two. This is something I've tried to implement in my own life, and it's actually part of why I got disillusioned with the academic career path, but story for another day. Peterson then takes it in a slightly weird turn by saying that this balance is much better than happiness without really elaborating on it at all. Instead, we're back into history of the book. I don't see these two as mutually exclusive. Why can't we be happy in the happy medium, Dr. P? Part of his drive for the Maps of Meaning was to try to figure out why the Cold War happened and how it escalated to a point where mutually assured destruction of both parties wasn't just a theoretical concept, but a potential reality that we were looking down. I couldn't understand how belief systems could be so important to people that they were willing to risk the destruction of the world to protect them. I came to realize that shared belief systems made people intelligible to one another, and that the systems weren't just about belief. Peterson says that these codes of conduct allow for predictable interactions with people and expectations of how others will behave. Okay, sure. But then he says maintaining these shared belief systems is super important, and that when they're threatened, the great ship of state rocks. I don't know quite what to make of this. How big a context are we talking about here? Traditional values? Defense of Western ideals against postmodern neo-Marxism? How does social change ever happen if changing the playbook is such a huge threat to social order? Or is change bad? Were the civil rights movements and women's rights movements bad? Am I overthinking this? He clarifies somewhat by saying that people will fight to maintain the match between what they believe, what they expect, and what they desire. They will fight to maintain the match between what they expect and how everyone is acting. Here's the first citation needed note of the book. Peterson says people do this to avoid the icky, chaotic uncertainty, and that people need to act predictably in order to get through life peacefully. Order good, uncertainty bad. I just… huh? He gives the example of someone being cheated on by their partner, and how awful it is for that person in the aftermath. And I think the implication here is that 
the person who did the cheating was acting chaotically, and if they'd been acting in an ordered manner, the cheating wouldn't have happened. I get that part, but I don't understand people fighting to protect the social contract order to avoid the negative chaos emotions. I mean, people fight for all kinds of things, that doesn't mean it's right. Dr. P builds on his previous idea that shared belief systems lead to an ordered life to say that this shared belief system also has built in it a hierarchy of value. And this hierarchy of value is demonstrated by some things being important and other things less so. Imagine, if you will, an underpaid adjunct professor sitting down to grade a stack of papers. And one of these papers has a bunch of very verbose, flowery writing and words with multiple meanings without those meanings nailed down. No context is given for these words, and really, they could have chosen better ways to say this, but they didn't. That's how I feel reading this. I've been trying to paraphrase as much as possible, but just let me share this part. A shared cultural system stabilizes human interaction, but also a system of value, a hierarchy of value, where some things are given priority and importance and others are not. In the absence of such a system of value, people simply cannot act. In fact, they can't even perceive, because both action and perception require a goal, and a valid goal is, by necessity, something valued. Surface level, sure. People value some things like food or sex over other things like self-actualization. Looking at you, Maslow. But on a deeper level, what is he on about? And I say this as somebody who grew up reading things like Anne Rice. So my writing reflected that. It was very flowery, very purple prose, and that was beaten out of me in undergrad. I was taught to write in science. You need to be clear and you need to be concise. Don't be vague. And on some level, Peterson's doing that, but if you start to really pick at it and dig at it, it falls apart. What exactly is a shared belief system? Is it something like Judeo-Christian values, or is it something more nebulous like the West? While he does sort of provide a definition of shared belief systems as shared systems of agreed upon conduct and expectation, that's somehow too vague and too specific at the same time. An example he gives of somebody being cheated on puts it at a very local level, but then later uses seem to apply to a whole society or whole groups of societies, and so what does he mean? And what happened to diversity? Having diverse opinions is an important part of decision making. If you have too many like-minded people deciding something, you end up in a situation like groupthink, and you end up with things like the Challenger explosion. You need to have diverse opinions in order to get good decisions happening. I'm honestly just a bit perplexed. Just what sort of value are we talking about here? Just like the cyclical definition where if something has value, it's important, and if it's important, it has value, and so we have a hierarchy of important things? Okay, sure, but I'm really going to have to request references for the whole people can't perceive if they don't have goals. I mean, maybe? You could make the case that somebody who's like in a vegetative, permanent vegetative state, very comatose, is lacking goals and can't perceive. But I don't think it's causal there. There's something else going on in there that's explaining the lack of goals driving behavior. Moving on. Come with me on the Dr. P logic flow. Shared cultural system equals a system of value, which is a hierarchy of value. Then hierarchy of value dependent on goals to establish value. Goals lead to happiness as progression to goals has value. But meaning of life without positive value is suffering. And suffering, as we all know, leads to the dark side where they have cookies, suffering cookies with raisins. Is it though? I mean, I guess a lot of the world's religions are built on trying to answer the question of why is there pain and suffering in the world? 
I've got bipolar depression. I've done my share of suffering. But my suffering was not because I'm not buying into the shared belief system or I'm lacking goals. I cannot believe that we must have the meaning inherent in a profound system of value or the horror of existence rapidly becomes paramount. Jesus will not fix my depression. But again, I'm not the target audience. Back to the logic flow, briefly. The intrinsic suffering of being has to be balanced by the system of value. Peterson makes a big deal of being with a capital B, so let's take a moment here. He got the idea from a German philosopher with the name Heidegger. This being is separate from objective reality and is tied to your personal and collective experiences. Personal and collective. Hmm. Being with a capital B is shaped by our free will and our choices, and so the being with a capital B is subjective instead of objective and immaterial, whereas the brain is material. Some people sometimes say Peterson isn't religious, but I'm not so sure. Without the balance from a system of value, nihilism awaits. I know I said I wasn't going to talk about Peterson outside of the book, but I just, I've got the sense of a gist that some of these talking points are about the left and our alleged nihilism. He summarizes it as no value, no meaning. I don't know if he allows for people to derive meaning from things that he doesn't intend. Like, I'm an atheist and a cat mom, so I'm deriving value and meaning from things that aren't religious or aren't traditional value based. So I don't know if he would argue that my life actually doesn't have meaning, or if he would say that the things I'm finding meaning from have value, therefore I have my own hierarchy of meaning and value, and blah 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 blah. I don't know. But there is a possibility of conflict between belief systems as evidenced by the Cold War and any war ever. Yep, not gonna dispute this part. Then he sets up two alternatives. One is that we have these shared belief systems, but then conflict between belief systems is an inevitable outcome. Or we lose the belief systems, but then we all fall into chaos and strife and misery. My husband jokes that he's making a pretty solid case for everybody being an atheist here. Then we come to an important part for the whole book. In the West, we have been withdrawing from our tradition, religion, and even nation-centered cultures, partly to decrease the danger of group conflict, but we are increasingly falling prey to the desperation of meaninglessness, and that is no improvement at all. Hold up, wait. I hate, I hate to bring up Freud, but is Peterson projecting here? Does he think that everybody is withdrawing from these things to avoid conflict? What? I have withdrawn from a lot of religion and tradition-centered expectations of me. And I didn't do it to avoid conflict. If anything, it caused conflict. And I'm not somebody who's in a super marginalized group fighting for basic human rights. Or is it something else here? The we that would be buying this book to read it seriously and attend his talks and formerly support him on Patreon. Are these people withdrawing from those things to avoid conflict? I mean, he is Canadian. Sorry, lovely country, lovely people, but y'all can be really passive aggressive sometimes. Fuck! I need a Freud jar. So. Maybe, as somebody who willingly withdrew from these things, I don't feel an emptiness in their absence. But for people who feel like they're having to abandon these things in order to avoid conflict, maybe they need a lobster daddy to tell them it's going to be okay, there's a way forward, there's hope. Don't take the black pill just yet. The most empathy I ever felt for Peterson was in an interview he did with Jim Jeffries, of all people. And they showed a clip of him, I think he was teaching, and a bunch of students came in with megaphones to drown him out. 
called him a Nazi and labelled him transphobic. Transphobic piece of shit! Transphobic piece of shit! And I finally understood why he thinks the left is trying to silence him. Because some of them are. And it was just crazy that people would be so disrespectful, even though I don't like his ideas. To do that to somebody, especially when they're doing their job, it's so disrespectful. I, I don't really know where I'm going with this, other than to just say, like, yeah, I disagree with him, but he's still a person. Like, come on. Since Peterson wrote Maps of Meaning in an attempt to understand how the Cold War happened, it's not surprising, to me at least, that he emphasizes that we've reached a point where conflict is dangerous. We're able to just wipe out huge numbers of people without much of a second thought. And so he was trying to come up with an alternative to the two he laid out where Either we have belief systems, but conflict, or no shared belief systems, but chaos. And in the process of doing this, he had a dream. Spot the union. In this dream, Peterson found himself hanging from the center of a cathedral, way above the ground, and that was scary. And then he somehow made it back to his bedroom, but then the cathedral drawers were in his bedroom, and that was scary, and it woke him up, and he took months figuring out the meaning of this dream. And so I'm going to read to you the description of the dream, but just keep in mind the Jungian approach and dream analysis and importance of symbols here. During this time, I came to a more complete personal realization of what the great stories of the past continually insisted upon. The center is occupied by the individual. The center is marked by the cross, as X marks the spot. Existence at that cross is suffering and transformation, and that fact, above all, needs to be voluntarily accepted. It is possible to transcend slavish adherence to the group and its doctrines and, simultaneously, to avoid the pitfalls of its opposite extreme, nihilism. It is possible, instead, to find sufficient meaning in individual consciousness and experience. From a dream. He got all of this from a dream. Sometimes I get dreams where I'm having trouble in an airport or with an airplane, and I know that those come when I'm very anxious about stuff. It's not telling me some greater secret of life, but that is a very Jungian thing to do. Basically, Peterson's middle path is for people to shoulder the burden of being and to take the heroic path. There is a lot of meaning packed in there, so let's break that apart. I think that this first part means that we need to realize that life isn't all sunshine and rainbows, and that we need to accept it. There's a part later in the overture that talks about some people not being able to bear this burden and the victimhood complex that develops as a consequence of it. Uh, but I think basically this is kind of like the British stiff upper lip, you know, just life sucks but keep going. The second part. Peterson chooses his words so carefully that I cannot believe that this isn't just a coincidence. In Jungian psychology, the hero's path or heroic path is something that people have to do in order to go through individuation, which is a process where they become a whole person by integrating their conscious and unconscious aspects of their personality. If you didn't watch my Jung video, that didn't make a lick of sense. Caveat. I really don't agree with the Jungian structure of personality, and I especially don't agree with the Jungian structure of mind, but I didn't write this book. Basically, prior to going through individuation, a person has a bunch of shit floating around in their unconscious, under the Jungian view. And when you go through individuation, you gain access to this stuff that's floating around so that you can understand it. You can process it, learn lessons from it, move forward, and be able to basically learn the life lessons you need to from it to be a better person. So to take the heroic path, people need to go through individuation. Putting these two halves together, we get that life is suffering and has unhappiness in it. And to get through it, 
you need to get your shit together. When I got to this part in the script, I felt kind of like Ralphie in A Christmas Story, when he finally gets the little decoder ring and he gets the message, be sure to drink your Ovaltine. I mean, I spent a lot of time and killed a lot of brain cells trying to understand Jungian psychology, and I did it in an attempt to be able to understand what seems to be drawing people in to Peterson, what's making him so magnetic to people, what's so important about this book. And I basically just summarized it as, life is hard, get your shit together. I feel a little underwhelmed. I guess this is probably the central theme to a lot of self-help books. Life is hard, get your shit together. Different window dressing. And maybe that window dressing helps people understand it, make sense of it, implement it. So I guess that works. And if you really think about it, it's probably the message behind a lot of the world's religions. Life is suffering, get your shit together. Different decor, fancier outfits, sky cake. I wonder what Peterson's version of sky cake is. Then there's an interesting disclaimer from Dr. P, where he says he's just doing the best he can. He may not be entirely correct or complete in his thinking. What possessed him to put that paragraph in this book, especially right after basically the central theme of the book? And we're not even at the end of the chapter. Strange, strange person. Then we start to wrap up the overture by talking about where the book title came from. Peterson says he likes it for its simplicity and its directness. You get 12 rules for life. These are an antidote to chaos. The rules come from people needing directions, lest we fall into chaos. And he said that the 12 rules are aimed at helping people walk the middle path between order and chaos. I have to disagree with him on where his aim is. He says he's aiming to be the balance between order and chaos, but I think he's landing solidly in the ordered camp. Peterson's description of the balance point is all about stability and cooperation to keep the chaos at bay. But to me, this reads like you're in camp at night and the light is the only thing keeping the monsters out there in the darkness. To me, that's setting up your house in the order neighborhood with chaos being out in the nature surrounding the city. And he practically uses that phrasing. Order is humanity fighting against the chaos that is the natural order of things. For a while, I was into Hinduism and Buddhism and even got into the Tao Te Ching. Like, I've read the stuff, got pretty into the ideas behind it, and the message I got from these isn't that chaos is something to fight against, that we need an antidote against it. The message I got is that we need to embrace both order and chaos. They're both part of life, and sometimes ordered things happen, sometimes chaotic things happen, but we need to roll with it. That's, that's the message I got from it, and I guess that's not really a message that a lot of people want to hear. One last quote from Dr. P. I hope that these rules will help people understand what they already know, that the soul of the individual eternally hungers for the heroism of genuine being, and that the willingness to take on that responsibility is identical to the decision to live a meaningful life. All right, I feel like this is just drenched in Jungian ideas. Plus the theme of life's hard, get your shit together. Part of Jungian therapy is for people to gain access to things in their unconscious, specifically archetypes that they got from the collective unconscious, which arguably under the Jungian approach, they would have had at birth. And so these things would be things that they already know. As described previously, the hero's journey is something that people need to go through, according to Jung, in order to be a whole, well-rounded adult. Something I'm not sure on here is how far Peterson's taking the meaning part. If you didn't watch the Jung video, in addition to the personality structure and the therapy, Jung also had a theory of personality development. 
In Jung's theory of development, people could progress through stages where they would focus on their body, and then themselves, and then others, and then finally on their divine nature. A critical thing to note here is that this last stage, the divine spirit stage, under Jungian psychology, is a goal that people should strive for. This is a stage that people should try to reach in order to lead a meaningful life. So I'm not sure if Peterson is meaning this meaning of meaning, but I guess we'll see as we go through the book. That is it for the overture of the 12 rules for life. The next chapter is rule one, stand up straight with your shoulders back. And the first word in the chapter is lobster. So you know we're in for a good time. And that's it for this video. If you have any questions, hit me up on Twitter or in the comment section. If you enjoyed it, leave a like. I've got a Patreon, maybe. And see you guys in the next video. Bye.